Today is day one of the Global Chess League, a brand new event brought into life by the World Chess Federation FIDE and a group of uh, tech entrepreneurs of uh, Mahindra. And it's, uh, it's a really exciting new concept with uh, six teams competing uh, against each other. And each team uh, features uh, six players. And the good news is that most of the world top players are participating. Since the main sponsor is from India, we are very excited to see a lot of strong Indian players as well. And particularly the fact that former world champion Fishy Anand is playing again, that is really exciting. So I would like to bring um, in this video the first game he played in this event. And as the nickname of uh, Fishy Anand is the uh, Tiger of Madras, when the Tiger gets the opportunity you are getting really exciting chess. Let's see what happens in his first round encounter with Jan Christoph Duda as Fischi opens the game with the move 1 e4, e5, knight f3, and Duda goes for knight c6. Actually, Duda is also an expert on the Petrov defense starting from the move knight f6. The knight c6 is, of course, a line he has played as well. And we get to see the Rue Lopez, and in fact, it's the Berlin defense. d3. Bishop c5, and now Fischi decides to take on c6 anyway. D takes c6. Now don't get tempted by taking the pawn on e5. This is a well-known blunder because of queen d4 with a double attack against the pawn on f2, threatening mate and the knight on e5. So instead, very typical idea here for white is to continue with its own uh, development. Knight bd2, as now... Uh, we are ready to get our knight to c4 very soon as well. Black protects the pawn on e5 with the move knight d7. It's one of the many available moves. White goes knight c4, castling, kingside, and white castles as well. So this is the first moment uh, white is actually really threatening to take the pawn on e5 because uh, there are no longer any counter-attacking ideas against the pawn on f2 as we have seen earlier. Rook e8 overprotecting the pawn on e5. The rook and the knight are both protecting the pawn. And now first interesting moment, because we do have a relatively closed position with an imbalance in pawn structure. Look, black has this double pawn on the c-file and it's a clash of uh, bishop pair versus the two knights. And the question is, of course, who is going to, uh, to be uh, favoring uh, that uh, factor in particular? Uh, so it's a close position, but White will look for ways to build up an initiative on the king side. And that's what we're going to get to see in this game. So things are going to build up very slowly, but be patient. Watch the entire video and you will be treated very nicely by the former world champion. White played here the move king h1. That's perhaps not a move you would have come up with yourself. Probably you're thinking about developing your remaining minor piece, something like bishop e3. That's perfectly fine. But with the move king h1, white has different ideas. Black would love to move the knight away from d7 so that the bishop from c8 can be released. But if you move the knight to f8, the pawn on e5 will be hanging. Therefore, black plays here the move f6. But this is a very understandable move. You're protecting the pawn, you're ready to go knight f8 next, but by playing the move f6, white does get the chance to play the move knight h4, which is not possible if the pawn is still on f7 because the queen will cover the h4 square, so the knight cannot go there. Black goes for the move knight f8. And what is white intending to do with uh, this knight move knight h4? Well, um, you're always looking for the f5 square. You would like to go there, but not immediately because you would like to recapture with a piece, not with a pawn. And therefore, white plays the move knight to, uh, to e3. You may wonder why not play the move f4. That's, of course, also a very typical plan to open up the f file for the rook, but this time there's e takes f4. And now white is unable to recapture with a piece as it does allow black to play the move g5 with a double attack, your winning material. So therefore f4 is premature, but definitely an idea white will keep in the back of its uh, mind. So instead white went for the move knight e3 so that after knight g6, offering the exchange of knights, white kindly declines it by jumping in to the f5 square with a knight, and black decides to take on e3. I'm not sure this is the best way of playing. It's definitely an interesting move, and white is for a choice. How to recapture 
on e3. First of all, the most logical move, bishop takes e3, in my opinion, is imprecise. Because of bishop takes f5, e takes f5, and now there is knight e7, and this pawn is a target, can be attacked one more time by the queen as well, but definitely black is in very comfortable shape here at all. So probably um, knight takes e3, keeping uh, the knight on the board, not allowing uh, black to trade off uh, the bishop for the knight anytime soon. And the knight is excellently placed in the center, even though it does block the bishop on uh, c1. But Fishy Anand has a different idea in mind for the bishop. So let's see what he is going to do. Black goes for bishop e6, and now white plays the move b3. Very nice, interesting pawn structure. All the pawns are placed on light squares, but um, Black's bishop is not able to attack the pawns uh, yet because of uh, very uh, strong uh, grip on these uh, light squares. The bishop is unable to attack the pawns properly. Black goes queen d4, hitting the rook on uh, a1. That's not a problem. The rook goes to b1. And now after rook a8, the bishop comes to b2 and black will be forced to move the queen uh, once again. Queen d6. So looks like not much is happening, but I believe white has a slightly better position here. Why? I really believe that potentially this bishop on b2 is going to be a monster. If you do get a chance to open up the position with moves like g3 and f4, it would be a dream coming true if this diagonal will be open. But you understand, with the queen on d6, pawn on e5, and the knight on g6, black still has a massive grip on the f4 square. So it's gonna take some time in order to break through on the king side. In the meantime, what can black do? We will see. White is playing here the move f3, not the only move, there are various ways of playing. And after the move c5, white goes g3. I think white could have started with g3 instead of f3, um, being a bit more flexible, but probably it comes down to the, to the same at some point. Black is going to play b5, and now you understand what black is aiming for. As black doesn't want to sit and wait, it's looking for ways to open up the queen side so that uh, black is able to generate some play by opening files over there. White goes queen e2, controlling the c4 square one more time. Black goes rook d7. And now black would probably consider doubling rooks on the d-file at some point. Or maybe the rook can help over on, uh, on b8 at some point. And now we understand what white's idea is with this move uh, f3. Because white played here rook f2. I like this move very much. It's a very flexible move, typical for ideas to build up an attack because now the other rook from b1 is able to come over perhaps to g1 maybe to f1 and uh, well the rook is doing pretty well on f2 uh, as well we will see why queen c6 white goes for the move h4 so what is the idea well very simple if black is gonna wait h5 will be played kicking the knight away and next f4 will be on the board. For instance, if black is going to move the knight right now, there will follow f4. Massive pressure against the pawn on e5. And um, if you do take, there is g takes f4. Now the bishop does increase in strength because the pawn on e5 is no longer there. And the g file is open. The rook can come over to g1. And you understand that with the rook on f2, you can quickly double rooks on the g file as well so i think white has tremendous attacking chances in this case black is not going to cooperate and instead duda plays here the move c4 trying to generate counterplay against the pawn on d3 now before allowing black to uh, to take on d3 white decided to take himself d takes c4 b takes c4 and b takes c4 interesting moment as you can see white is a pawn up but it's a double pawn and the question is is this pawn really worth something i think actually not i think black is still doing pretty okay if he would have played here a move like rook b8 i think this is an excellent move getting the other rook into the game by pinning the bishop on b2. The bishop cannot move because the rook is hanging, while the rook cannot go away because then the bishop will be captured. And this is not simple at all. I don't really see how white is going to make uh, progress in this case. I believe the pin is very unpleasant. Instead, black played here the move queen to c5. 
And I think now, for instance, a move like bishop c3 would be very useful to prevent rook b8 ideas, and who knows, maybe bishop b4 or rook b5 could be considered. Instead, white decided to drop back with the rook to f1 to protect the rook on b1. So now rook b8 is no longer a problem, you can always move the bishop away. But you see, by sacrificing that pawn on the queen side, white's initiative on the king side has slowed down. And uh, I think, um, yeah, therefore white's play was probably also not uh, completely uh, precise. But it's still a game, black goes rook d8, and you see the rook is about to enter on d2. That looks very dangerous. Therefore, bishop c3 covering the d2 square and now queen a3 attacking the bishop on c3. White's gonna play rook b3 protecting the bishop and attacking the queen, of course. And of course, you cannot take the pawn on a2 because that allows rook a1 and the queen is trapped in the, in the corner. So that's not a good move. But you see black is playing a lot of moves with the queen. It's not really clear if white... Um, sorry, if black really knows what he what he is doing here. The queen went back to a6. To be honest, I'm not completely convinced by, by black's play at all. And now finally, the queen has been kicked out to, to a6. White goes for h5, kicking the knight on g6. The knight goes back to e7. And now we understand that ideas with f4, they are definitely possible. But once you go f4, think about that pawn on e4, maybe there are ideas with queen c6 and the king side will be uh, become more vulnerable as well. So white instead plays here the move h6. This is a very modern attacking idea, trying to weaken the king side structure in front of uh, the black uh, king. So for instance, uh, g takes h6 is not the kind of move you want to play. It's a weakening move and I believe that uh, white has various ways of uh, proceeding here, including something like queen h2, or like after black is gonna play something like uh, g6, I would love to install my knight on d5 now. Um, with knight e5, you're intending to take the pawn on f6. This is one of the key ideas, but the problem is there is knight takes d5, e takes d5, and you can simply take with a piece on d5. As the pawn on c4 is pinned, white cannot take the rook on d5. Therefore, the key idea, and I'm pretty sure this was Fishy's plan as well, he wanted to overprotect the queen on e2 with rook f2, preparing to jump in with the knight to d5. If the knight comes into d5, you're closing the d file. There is no counterplay for, um, for black at all on that file, and you're able to improve your pawn structure. So this looks pretty nice. Instead, black didn't react at all, ignored the pawn on h6, played knight c6 with the idea to come into d4. Rook e1 played to protect the queen, very similar to this rook f2 move. And now black goes knight d4. Bishop takes d4 and big question is how is black gonna recapture? If you do take with the pawn, attacking the knight on e3, there is knight e5. And uh, black is probably still slightly worse uh, thanks to that knight on d5, white has a grip. At least, I don't see how the rooks are able to infiltrate. Instead, rook takes d4 is a more ambitious move and was played in the game, but now white is gonna capture on g7. This is going to be very sharp because both sides have a lot of weaknesses. Both kings are potentially quite vulnerable, but it remains a mystery to me why black didn't just capture the pawn on c4. I believe that is by far the safest way of playing. After knight takes c4, queen takes c4, it seems to me that black has a lot of counterplay. White is ending up with a lot of weak pawns after the exchange of queens. At some point, the pawn on g7 can just be eliminated. And I think this is leading to a more or less equal endgame. However, black decided to play more actively with the move rook d2. Also very understandable because now the queen has only one square to go. It will go to f1 and um, you should still realize that a move like queen takes a2 is never possible because of rook to a1. The queen is trapped as the knight on e3 is a fantastic piece protecting the pawn on c2. So the queen is badly placed. The rook is cutting off the white king on the back rank, but it's not really clear how to make progress. King takes g7 was played and now material 
is like white is still a pawn up and will play here the move g4 very interesting move what is white contemplating here that's very very interesting and there are chances for both sides but you should understand it's a rapid game players are getting lower on time and mistakes are obviously in the air black played queen a5 maybe something like h5 with the idea to swing the rook over to h8 is very interesting however after g takes h5 rook h8 would be a bad blunder because of queen to g1 if you go king f7 it's queen g6 and white is going to win very soon with ideas to take the pawn or give a double attack if you play something else instead after g takes h5 for instance king f7 then it's still very unclear with ideas to get a rook over to h8 an interesting line could be that white's going to play f4 with the idea to take or to push the pawn black may consider rook h8 white's going to play f5 hitting the bishop rook takes h5 check king g1 and now black can at least make a repetition of moves by going back and forth probably there's not much better for black and also not for white so a draw seems to be the logical outcome however back to the game after g4 white is trying to get a grip on the f5 square or get the queen into action as well queen a5 played and now the queen comes to g1 excellent move the queen is trying to push the pawn to g5 in order to open the file towards the black king maybe a move like h6 is possible so that after a knight check of course you're not going to take because that will enable white to enter with the queen but after king h7 seems like black is still doing okay because white is not really able to become very active in um, in this case so critical moment h6 was not played king g6 was played i think this is a very optimistic move by black and very typical for duda's playing style white played here the move queen g3 excellent move and now the queen is on its way to h4 maybe to h5 and the king is doing absolutely nothing on g6 so very strange decision for instance if black is going to play h6 to prevent g5 ideas there will follow queen h4 and after queen takes a2 now white can open up the position with a move like f4 you may think what's happening after e takes f4 there is knight f5 you're opening up the third rank for your rook threatening to take on h6 if you take with the queen on c2 it's queen h5 king h7 and now queen takes h6 leading to checkmate you understand this is the sort of risk black is taking by focusing on the queen side it's neglecting its own king safety on the king side after queen g3 instead of h6 there followed the move queen takes a2 but now white has even a faster way of opening up the position in the form of g5 excellent move you're ready to take on f6 with check on the next move the rook can come over deadly attack black decided to take with a pawn on g5 but now it's queen takes e5 excellent move threatening to capture the bishop with check or even their ideas with rook a1 to trap the queen look at that queen on e5 in the center of the board queen a6 played the queen had to go back to protect the bishop but now another powerful move you can see the eye of the tiger it's the move f4 threatening to go f5 with check winning the bishop this is looking very bad even queen takes g5 is a second threat so therefore g takes f4 was played simple move here could be rook g1 that's absolutely fine fishy the tiger of madras played here the move knight d5 also an excellent move and here black collapsed took on d5 which is uh, losing instantly because it does allow white to play here the move rook to g1 with check if the king goes to h6 it's rook h3 with checkmate beautiful ladder mate with two rooks at the side of the board if the king goes into the other direction to f7 there is rook to g7 king f8 and queen e7 with checkmate beautiful attack and you see that these quiet games with all 16 pawns on the board for a long period of time it doesn't mean it's boring at all in fact it was a very nicely sharp tense battle with chances for both let's go back to that final moment after knight d5 maybe black could have still tried to put up more resistance with bishop g4 but then there is rook to g1 pinning the bishop 
So black will try to keep the G file closed with h5, but now I love the next move, rook h3. There are various different alternatives for, for white as well, but I love to place the rook on h3. The bishop is pinned, cannot take the rook on h3, and one of the ideas is to play queen takes h5 with check. The rook and the queen are teaming up against the pawn on h5. Knight takes f4 is an idea. So many threats, this is just game over. I hope you really enjoyed this fantastic game of former world champion Fishy Anand. Make sure to give it a like. I would like to see you back tomorrow with more coverage of the Global Chess League and many other interesting things you will find on the channel. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye bye.